Good evening and welcome to tonight's program titled Autistic Women Unique Perspectives. My name is Dr. Susan Brasher and I am the program chair with the Atlanta Autism Consortium's Board of Directors. The Atlanta Autism Consortium or the AAC is a nonprofit organization dedicated to creating collaborative conversations throughout the Metro Atlanta autism community and beyond. We host free programs just like this on a wide variety of topics and are so glad that you've joined us. Before we get started, we have just a few reminders. As an attendee, your microphone and camera will remain muted, but you can ask any questions you have throughout the program by putting your question in the chat and clicking for that to send to us. We will be monitoring the chat and the questions as well that are coming in, and we will provide opportunities for our panelists to answer those questions as well. We will also have time at the end of the program to fully address all questions and any extra questions that you may have had. Additionally, we will be emailing out the contact information of our panelists to the email address you used to register for this program for those that have agreed to share their contact information so that you can contact them directly with any questions and further collaborate with our panelists. Tonight, we have a great panel of these amazing young autistic women, and we are going to be moderated as well by Dr. Celine Saunier. So I will pass it over to Dr. Saunier, and then she will open up with a little bit of context around autistic women before our panelists will be sharing their questions. All right. Well, welcome, everyone. I'm going to share my slides and then... Um to give the background and then introduce our amazing women on this panel. So welcome everyone. And thank you so much, Susan, for putting all of this together. I'm Dr. Celine Saulnier. I'm a clinical psychologist here in Atlanta, and I specialize in diagnostic evaluations across the lifespan, but I have spent the first 20 years of my career in academia, first at the Yale Child Study Center and then at Emory University School of Medicine and the Marcus Autism Center and conducting research in a wide variety of areas. So a lot of what I'm gonna be presenting to you is really the, the science behind how we conduct evidence-based practices in, in diagnostic evaluations. I have been a member of the Atlanta Autism Consortium's uh, Board of Directors since I moved here in 2011. And it's just such an honor to put on these programs for the community and especially for ones like tonight where we're reaching far beyond the Atlanta community. We have over 200 registrants from across the United States and maybe even beyond. And I'm just so thrilled about that. So welcome to everybody. Um, I do just want to plow through these slides really quickly, but know that as an attendee, you will have access to these slides. You'll be emailed a way to download them as well as an article that I'm going to talk about, and they'll be there for you. But there are diagnostic criteria for autism spectrum disorder in what we call the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual, which is in its fifth edition. Autism spectrum disorder has two areas of vulnerability or impairment. And these are in social communication and interaction, and then the presence of what we call restricted repetitive and stereotyped interests. And when you have restricted and repetitive behaviors, there need to be at least two by history. And when we're conducting diagnostic evaluations, this is what we're looking for. But it's not just in the current presentation of the individual. We, we conduct very comprehensive developmental histories because some of these behaviors, many individuals, certainly into adolescence and adulthood, learn to not show them or exhibit them. And we'll talk about that. And even though when we talk about the female presentation of autism, that females tend to fall sub threshold of these diagnostic criteria, there are still other criteria that we would still expect to be present. First and foremost, that autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder, which means it unfolds over the first few years of, of life. And even if those symptoms go undetected until later in development, they still must be present in early childhood. And then also the symptoms, whatever they are, need to cause clinically significant impairment. And this is really important because as a diagnostician, I am not um, going to be providing this diagnostic label to individuals who aren't experiencing any vulnerabilities or impairment, that they just may have 
a quirky personality. They may feel like they're they're different from other people. It really does have to come down to the the clinically significant impairment, and then that the the symptoms are not accounted for by some other condition like intellectual disability. There is a lot of misinformation out there, as I'm sure you know, that everything on social media and TikTok and in Google is not necessarily accurate. And my colleagues at Drexel University, some of you may have heard them present on this article last year here at the Atlanta Autism Consortium, where they actually studied the most viewed uh, videos, the top 200 videos, I believe, on TikTok that had over 11 billion views and very sobering findings that only 27% of the information in those videos was accurate and more sobering, 41% of the content was classified as inaccurate. Therefore, I just want the take home message to be that just beware of all the information that's out there in the media and, and online, and that contrary to popular belief, Google is not necessarily um, evidence-based. When we provide the diagnosis of ASD, we provide a, a level of functioning. There is level one, which would be the most mild, but still the symptoms require support, that we're providing accommodations and recommendations for treatment and intervention even if I'm diagnosing an adult for the first time. Then there's level two, that's requiring substantial support. And then you have level three. These are your most severely affected individuals. This is where um, many individuals who are minimally to nonverbal and or have global developmental delays or intellectual disability. These are the individuals that would likely need 24 hour care lifelong. And those levels are fluid those levels can change throughout development. So um, we're providing those levels based on the symptoms. So you can have a level one for your social vulnerabilities and a level two for your restricted and repetitive behaviors or vice versa, but they can change over time. And the spectrum is very, very broad and it has widened over the years. Now, in fact, just even since I've been in the field since the early 1990s, the diagnostic criteria have drastically changed. It used to be very narrow and classic autism. The majority of individuals had co-occurring intellectual disability and language impairments. And the diagnostic criteria at that time required a history of a language delay to meet criteria for autistic disorder, for example. Whereas now, that has changed. There is no criterion that says there has to be a history of, a, of any cognitive or language impairment. Um, and in fact, the majority of individuals across the spectrum today do not have intellectual disability or cognitive delays. And only about 25% have uh, minimally to nonverbal levels of functioning. When we talk about levels of functioning, you've probably heard people say high functioning autism, low functioning autism, and everything in between. That's really talking about level of cognitive ability, and we try to move away from that terminology because it can be misleading. Um, there are many high cognitive, high verbal individuals that are very impaired in life, and there are many individuals with, with cognitive and language impairments that are doing quite fine and um, everything therein. But when you have cognitive impairment and language impairment, you may be more likely to have medical co-occurring conditions like seizures, uh, cardiac defects, and maybe autoimmune issues. And when you don't have cognitive and language impairments, your co-occurring conditions may be more psychiatric, having anxiety, depression, suicidality. And these are things that we keep in mind when we're conducting diagnostic evaluations because these would be the differentials, not to mention co-occurring conditions. And because this spectrum has become so broad, there is now a very gray area or very like fine line between what is neurotypical versus what is neurodiverse. And that didn't used to be the case. Classic autism was, it was almost categorical. You knew that that was the disability, whereas neurotypical development, there was a much clearer delineation. Now with this increasing blurry line, it is very hard to determine a a categorical label versus a dimensional approach to sort of conducting these evaluations. Yet, 
what makes the someone get the label and someone not get the label really comes down to clinical judgment. It really is my perception based on all of the, the information I gather during the evaluation. And that's hard. Um, we don't always get it right as clinicians, not to mention someone could literally walk across the street to another clinic and a clinician could have another uh, diagnostic formulation. And this is, it just adds to the confusion. And then also something to keep in mind that there is a fluidity in how we're even using terminology in the field. That do we use identity first language, meaning it's an autistic person, the autism is, is who the person is, that's not disordered, it's different. Or are we using person first language, which is it's an individual with autism. Autism does not define who the person is. When you look at it from a research perspective that uh, clinicians and uh, practitioners and researchers tend to prefer the person first language, whereas individuals on the autism spectrum themselves, self-advocates, and even some parents and family members tend to prefer identity first language. However, that's not universal. So my advice to you is to just ask the individual or the group with whom you're speaking. What is your preference? And then use that language. And because we have such a large group here, um, you'll probably hear me uh, interchange these and go back and forth between identity first and person first language. To update you on the current statistics of, of autism, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta do epidemic epidemiological studies every two years and tell us what the prevalence of autism is. And just this year, we now have one in 36 school-aged children will be diagnosed with autism. That's a lot. That's over 2% of the population. Um, this is drastically increased since when I started in the field, it was two per 10,000. There are about three to four times more males diagnosed with autism than females, which is why we're all here. We're going to talk about those discrepancies. And the average age of diagnosis in this country is about four and a half, despite the fact that we can reliably diagnose autism in infants and toddlers, definitely by 18 to 24 mo months in most cases. And then it is one of the most, if not the most highly heritable of all childhood uh, conditions, where if a family has one child with autism, the likelihood of having a subsequent child with autism jumps from one in 36 to one in five. Now, um, this study by Sally Ozanoff and colleagues just came out a couple of weeks ago, confirming that, just reiterating what we already knew in the research. And not just one in five siblings will have full-blown autism, another one in five biological symptoms will have shadow symptoms of autism, meaning they have some of those symptoms in the DSM, but not enough to meet full criteria. And then another one in 10 will have non-autism developmental delays, like speech delays or cognitive delays. So 50% of siblings will be vulnerable in their development, so we want to watch them closely as well. What we're learning, though, is that the diagnostic criteria and everything we know about autism has been conducted on males. That's because when you have a four to one ratio and we as scientists only are dealing with a certain number of participants in a study, so let's say a research study had 50 participants and we only had five females, well, that's not enough to statistically analyze, so we drop the females from those analyses. So all the publications that have been conducted over you know, decades were predominantly on males, and that's what informed the diagnostic criteria. Also, when, when autism was narrowly defined, and we saw females with autism, those one in four, they tended to be more severely affected. And when you looked at genetic mutations identified in females versus males, the females, despite having the identical symptom expression as a male, would have a larger genetic hit, a larger genetic mutation to, to appear that impaired. So that tells us that there's some female protective effect and now that the spectrum has broadened so much and we now have all of these uh, individuals at the higher cognitive, higher language end coming onto the spectrum, that female protective effect is the reason why we're seeing females go sub-threshold of the diagnostic criteria. Because those who have intact language and cognition, that they're going to present with more subtle symptomatology. 
and females just by nature of being a female. And when I say female, I mean assigned female at birth. And we we can get into the to the discussion if if needed on why there happens to be a higher incidence of transgender in autism and a higher in, uh, incidence of autism symptomatology in transgendered individuals, not necessarily one and the same thing, um, but so there may be transgender males who present with the same female presentation because they're assigned female birth. That said when we have a female coming into the world, just even in neurotypical development, females are more socially intuitive. They tend to observe more. They tend to be more socially intuitive and aware of what's going on in group dynamics, et cetera. And because of that, even females who go on to have autism will be more observant and, and if you're observing your social world more, you're modeling and imitating your social world more. So you might see more what's called masking and camouflaging. The females on the autism spectrum have enough awareness to know that they don't really know how to navigate the social interaction, especially as they get into those middle school and, and teenage years, but they are observant enough to borrow. So they watch videos of really current TV shows or they watch other people and then they they uh, mimic those behaviors in real life. And that's called masking or camouflaging. But what happens when individuals do that and males can do that too, that causes a lot of internal distress. So what you'll end up seeing is a lot more anxiety and even depression and suicidality as a result of that effort of masking and camouflaging. And when we look at the diagnostic criteria, you're going to see that stronger social reciprocity. You're going to see a back and forth, a motivation, whereas the, the classic autism in males was described to be more socially aloof and withdrawn. You're going to see a lot more symbolic and imaginary play in females where that tends to be more impaired in males. And this leads to misdiagnoses because clinicians will will know the research on play and say, well, she was engaging in imaginary play even with peers, so that can't be autism. What we tend to see is that the females might actually extend their symbolic and imaginary play way beyond when it's de developmentally uh, age appropriate. So you might see teenagers and even adults playing with dolls or My Little Pony or things like that. And then definitely having, um, those masking and camouflaging abilities to observe and mimic. And then the restricted interests, the, the classic autism, when you look at the literature, it's objects and things, right? Trains and reptiles and Titanic and things like that. Whereas in females, it tends to be more people related or even animal related. It could be characters, animated characters or real characters, or it could be actual people that these uh, females develop intense interest in. So that's more normalized. So again, teachers, people in the community, and even clinicians doing the evaluations can be like, well, her, her interests are just kind of like in things that all of the other girls her, her age are interested in. Um, it's whatever TV show character, or it's whatever this. And that again, normalizes what actually is a symptom. And then finally, I want to say that because this is such a newer area of research, there are a lot of us in the field that, that don't know what to do when we're diagnosing females because the research is just still evolving and research takes a long time. That I am bound by these diagnostic criteria in the DSM, but these females are falling subthreshold. So then it's my, again, my diagnostic um, I'm, I'm relying on my knowledge and expertise to say, I'm going to give this diagnosis even if this person falls th sub-threshold, not just on the DSM criteria, but even on the scores of our diagnostic instruments like the ADOS, um, for example. And so what COVID did that was actually helpful in this regard is that it caused a paradigm shift when autism evaluations really require in-person assessment because you're dealing with social communication and interaction and assessing that in vivo. So what happened when COVID shut us all down, 
mostly the researchers, but definitely the clinicians as well. But researchers are bound by these evidence-based practices and gold standard measures that were only in person. So we all jumped on Zoom calls from all over the world and would have monthly calls on what do we do? What other instruments can we use and what kind of um, you know shifts can we make in diagnosis? As the COVID pandemic you know, kind of lifted, we as clinicians and researchers really felt that this was beneficial to us to be kind of having this group supervision on a monthly basis or on a consistent basis. So we started developing work groups on other topics just so we could stay involved with one another on a regular basis. And there was a subgroup of us that decided to focus on females. And then in order to do this, we needed to include stakeholders. That's females themselves on the autism spectrum, as well as parents. And so at, I, I think it was probably about a year that we were discussing all the ways in which we can improve autism identification in females when we finally wrote a paper. And this paper was published in one of the most um, respected journals worldwide called Lancet. And we have one of our panelists tonight, Dylan Miller, was an author on this paper, as was another self-advocate, Marana Kay, and then we had two parents, and the parents were Alicia Halliday and Amy Kelly. So just goes to show you that it when, when we are using everybody who ha is a stakeholder in this field, and we can all like put our heads together and say, from everyone's perspective, what are the needs here in identifying women from, from birth? all the way throughout the lifespan because we're missing so many of them. And so I made this paper available for you and you'll have it in the Google Drive at the end. So with that, um, I'm going to bring it back to our panel and I'm gonna stop sharing here so that I can introduce everyone. Um, we have Dylan and Laura and Kayla and Virginia and Chloe, but you don't wanna hear from me, you wanna hear directly from them. So I'm going to start um, we, we have a series of questions that they're, they're, we're gonna ask the panelists and they're all gonna take turns answering. And then at the end of um, those discussions, we wanna open it up so that all of you, and there are so many of you on tonight, which is very exciting, that you can contribute to the discussion as well. And then this recording will be made available to you on YouTube. So um, feel free to send the link to people. But um, to get started, because I know Dylan, I'm going to start with Dylan. I know many of the panelists, but Dylan, just so you know, I've known for, I want to say over 30 years. Um, I met Dylan when she was three. So why don't you tell everyone who you are and um, the, your interest in autism and the age at which you were diagnosed? Well, hi, everyone. My name is um, Dylan Miller, and I am 32 years old. So I was diagnosed with autism when I was one after my parents took me to a pediatric uh, neurologist. So it was a very early uh, detection and that later progressed into high functioning autism, which I learned uh, more about um, as I got older. And it was also, it was always uh, fascinating to me. So fast forward, I was um, homeschooled for a really big majority of my life until I started to study for my GED when I was uh, 17. And I earned my GED at Holyoke Community College in 2010, I believe. Um, af after that, I continued to go to Holyoke Community College. And then in 2012, I graduated with an associate's in hospitality management and also a certificate in culinary. And because I loved um, cooking so much, I went to the New England Culinary Institute in Montpelier, Vermont. And I graduated in December, 2013. And then from there, I worked uh, various culinary jobs. And currently, I am one of the head cooks at UMass um, in Amherst in catering. And I've been um, a head cook there for about 
two and a half years now with an all-male team. So I'm currently the um, only woman that's um, in the catering kitchen. Thank you so much. That your your whole history is just awesome. I love the fact that you're doing what you love. Um, all right, I'm going to pass it on now to Kayla. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kayla Rodriguez. Um, I am an aut. I use identity first language, so I am an autistic woman. And I'm also identified as non -bi partly non-binary, so I use she, they pronouns. So I'm an autistic woman and non-binary person with ADHD. You know, I'm, I'm autistic and have ADHD. I was initially diagnosed with PDD, which was which is now known as being autistic when I was three years old. Um, I think it eventually evolved into Asperger syndrome, but, but I don't use that term anymore because that term's kind of been you know, um, you know, it's a problematic term. Uh, so um, last year I was re-diagnosed as autistic at 27 years old, which is the age I currently am. Uh, I love to write and I love video games. I also love to be an advocate. I am the executive advisory board co-chair of the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network alongside Marina Kay. So Marina Kay is a good friend of mine. Um, and I am part of the Women Enabled International U.S. Alliance, um, though I am here representing myself. And I recommend you guys, if you guys are interested, I could send you the websites for those two, or those two, you know, Women Enabled International and the Autistic Women Non-Binary Network because they're really great organizations. And I'm really glad to be a part of them. So, um, yeah. Kayla, we would love to have those to send to everyone on the panel. And everyone who's who's attending tonight, all the registrants, because those are two amazing organizations. And you mentioned a very important thing that I should probably educate uh, the, the registrants who don't know, but Asperger's syndrome, a former subtype. Of, that's subsumed under the autism spectrum now. Uh, Asperger, the researcher, has been found to be associated with Hitler and the Nazis. So even though the subtype is very important to know about in our history, the label Asperger syndrome or Asperger's disorder is something that's kind of going by the wayside. So thank you for bringing that up. All You're right. Welcome. Can I can I share? I'm sorry to interrupt, but can I share the websites on the, in the chat? Of course. Okay, I will do that now. Thank you. But because there's so many people, if they get lost in the chat, um, we will also make them available in the Google Drive. Okay, great. All Thank right. You. Chloe, you're up. Hi, my name is Chloe Sitch. I'm 28 years old, and I prefer identity first language, so an autistic female. Um, although I don't really have a preference, but today I'm feeling spicy, and I'm just going to do autistic female. But basically, um, I am, I have autism, I have spina bifida, I'm hard of hearing, I have ADHD, and I have PTSD from my spina bifida. And I love to do a lot of advocacy work. So basically, what I've been doing is I do the women with autism group that I was introduced with. And that's how I got connected with Dr. Brasher and Laura and Kayla and, you know, all those people and the A, the Atlanta Autism Consortium. And then also I am really into, I did an echo with Dr. Brasher a couple of years ago. I um, am a part of the Spina Bifida Association's uh, Georgia, Tennessee chapter. And I'm an adult advisory board member for them. Um, I help, you know, we're kind of rebranding our chapter right now because the Georgia, Tennessee chapters merged during COVID because we used to have like one Georgia, one Tennessee. And also I'm on their walk and roll planning committee and they have just been, you know, so blown away by everything that I am going to be featured in their newsletter that's going out to all their doctors and their clinicians and stuff. I'm currently doing a study right now with um, Indiana University. Um, 
and it's about creating a bowel and bladder app for there's a bowel and bladder app that they made for kids with spina bifida but they want to tweak it and make it available to teens and adults so i'm on their planning committee as well as some other adults with spina bifida to talk about that i am also going to be in a documentary for individuals with autism um through one of my lovely connections named laura she um posted it out in the women with autism group but it's basically about a guy um who his name was david he had autism and it's known as the 22 year cliff where once you turn 22 years old schools have to stop providing services to autistic and disabled individuals and then it's like where do you go from there and basically you know this documentary um ben and karen are basically the producers of it ben's karen's son and karen is you know just their mom but they're like doing all this and david tragically passed away two years ago in 2022 of a seizure and they were considering like tabling whether they should continue to do it or not and they decided to do it to honor his wishes and me like i'm in the documentary i've been given camera equipment and i filmed myself i also on you know another topic i film youtube content and i do a lot of like content on youtube and stuff like that just sharing out and about my experiences in my life um you know my dad passed away two years ago and i basically didn't know any i only had one best friend who was neurotypical and able-bodied who had gone through the same experience that i did and she was very very helpful but i want other people to be educated because i literally throughout my whole lifespan have had to do this work all on my own um and i you know, some of it my parents helped me out with because, you know, they were able to get the help. But, you know, um, because of the denial and stuff that my dad had, I literally had to, like, go through all of this um, myself and having to, like, pick up pieces and file for this and file for that. Um, I was actually um, on the phone with Social Security and I was actually delayed. Uh, she, um, we were supposed to meet at 2.15, but she was two hours late and only to find out that I need to get myself a lawyer. So it's just stuff like that, you know, that I like to share about. Um, and also I should say, um, my, um, I have a brother with autism as well. He prefers the term Asperger's. I do not prefer the term Asperger's because I want to pay respect to my Jewish friends because I have a lot of Jewish friends and I don't want them to feel offended or anything like that. So um, I'll just say that he's autistic, but um, basically with my journey of autism, so I, you know, something was detected in utero through my mom's OBGYN. She had gestational diabetes and stuff. And then at two and a half, we found out that I had spina bifida. And then, you know, through that, um, you know, cause we didn't find out right away. Um, my neurosurgeon told my parents to not teach me how to walk because we weren't sure if I was going to be able to. And in the meantime, teach her something that she can do. So my parents taught me my colors, letters, numbers, and shapes. And I became keenly interested in that kind of stuff. And my third grade year, I ended up being diagnosed with ADHD. And then my fourth grade year, I ended up being diagnosed um my parents paid out of pocket for me to get diagnosed by a psychoeducational person. Um, I won't mention her name because she's not in existence anymore, but she said I have borderline pervasive developmental disorder, not otherwise specified, PDDNOS, which is what Kayla had. And I was always told, though, by my parents that I was autistic. 
And I, you know, kept on going out through life just fine, blah, blah, blah. And then I tried to apply for family support services here in Georgia and I was rejected because I was never diagnosed autistic in the first place. So I was like, uh, moo. So I went to my parents and they were, um, we then went to my therapist that I was seeing through the Emory Autism Center. And she said that I was never diagnosed autistic because she took a look at my eval and she said I was borderline PDD-NOS and not actually autistic like we had thought. And also she never used the ADOS on me, which is like the gold standard. And therefore I was never diagnosed autistic. So I got reevaluated through the Emory Autism Center and I ended up being diagnosed with autism. And they said if Asperger's were still a thing, which again, I don't like that term, but I would have Asperger's like my brother. Um, and yeah, that's basically my whole story. Sorry for the novel, but um, no, Chloe, like that is that. wonderful. And um, thank you for sharing all that and your organizations and, and your YouTube, because we're going to put that in the chat and also make that available to everyone. And I love that you're feeling spicy. I hope <laughs> a lot of us are feeling spicy. So I <laughs> also want to mention too, I don't mean to interrupt, but um, my mom had always suspected too, that um I was autistic because she used to be a special needs teacher, but my dad was in denial. And I feel like the, I feel comfortable sharing that because, you know, the worst thing that can happen is I get struck by lightning because, you know, he's dead. But um, I mean, I just want to share that because I feel like it's so important because I feel like some parents can probably relate to that kind of stuff. Yeah. You know? And you know what about the subtypes? Because prior to 2013, the DSM um, category was pervasive developmental disorders under which there was autism, but right. then the catch-all PDD-NOS, not otherwise specified. And that was because the individual didn't have the full criteria for autism. And then there was Asperger syndrome. What the research showed was there really was no differentiation between those three subtypes. The only thing that determined who would have a different subtype was the clinic doing the diagnosing. That was the only thing. So that's why they did away with the subtypes and made autism spectrum disorder one category. And, um, and then everything would fall under that, which is why PDD-NOS is now autism spectrum disorder. So both you and Kayla. And it's interesting that both of you have co-occurring ADHD because they do have such overlapping symptomatology that it's been controversial of whether or not those two conditions can actually overlap. Um, but I wanna bring it on to uh, Virginia. Would you like to go next? Yeah, I'll go. Um, well, first of all, I'm just really happy to be here and having the opportunity to, to tell my story a little bit. Um, one thing that I've learned in my journey is that like the lived experiences of others are so crucial when it comes to trying to understand and navigate a lot of this stuff. Um, so my name is Virginia Jack. I am, uh, I also use identity first language. So I'm a, on a, I am an autistic woman and my pronouns are she, her. Um, kind of similar to Dylan. And it's really funny that you mentioned that because we haven't really had a chance to connect before this, but I also was, um, had, you know, was homeschooled kind of on again, off again in my um, childhood. And I think that my, my personal journey feels a little different. Um, first of all, to answer the question about diagnosis, I am a late diagnosed um, autistic woman. So I was diagnosed two years ago when I was 32. Um, and I have a autism level one and um, ADHD and then other stuff too. Um, but essentially I, it took me so long to get diagnosed because I just had so many other things that demanded my immediate attention or ability to sift through before I could even get to this level of understanding about myself. Um, so I grew up in a very, uh, like controlling and, um, religiously controlling home and, um, there was a lot of uh, abuse and there was a lot of um, just 
you never really knew what you were going to expect in terms of like day to day. So there could be an explosion one day in terms of an argument or something you could do could set off one person and then the next day it wouldn't be an issue. And so I think that in terms of my ability to understand myself, I really use masking as a survival tool to just be able to get through the days. Um, and so on top of that, there was also like a lot of religious trauma associated with that too. So, um, you know, a prescribed way of moving through the world, of showcasing yourself, of um, portraying yourself to others. And there was a lot of rules that you kind of had to follow or expected to follow. Um, and then between the homeschooling and everything else, it just kind of, I always felt othered in some way, but I never knew, I just always assumed it was those different pieces. Um, and I ended up moving out of my home when I was 19 because things had just gotten to a point where it, I didn't feel safe staying there anymore. And it just, I knew that I needed to, um, get out. So I also got my GED and, um, got my associates at my uh, local community college and just in liberal arts. But, um, and then after that, I was putting myself through school for my undergrad and working full time. And so in between ages 19 and 22, I was, you know, kind of staying with different friends and their families. At one point I was sleeping on a couch for a year, uh, my friend's apartment. Um, I'd been with my boyfriend for four years and we had ended up building a house together and got engaged and got married. And so there's just a lot of like big life changes that had happened and a lot of different roles that I had to show up and fulfill. And Honestly, I don't even, looking back, I don't even know how I went to school full-time and worked full-time. Like, I <laughs> I know that was just, like, teetering on the edge of burnout, um, and I think afterwards, I really was experiencing a lot of burnout, but um, after that, I ended up have, going through a divorce and going through other, like, personal challenges, and so when I was in therapy, and I've been in therapy since 2014, working through all this stuff there was always like these specific things that I just couldn't seem to change or make much headway on. And they were always about routines and systems and habits and like social dynamics and just kind of feeling like I never really understood how to make changes or like I knew where I wanted to be because that's where everybody else seemed to be, but I didn't seem to be able to get there. Um, and so it wasn't until you know, TikTok had been mentioned already, but it wasn't until 2020 when me and so many other millennials got on TikTok and my algorithm like immediately moved me to neurodivergent TikTok. And I will agree, there are a lot of um, creators and videos out there that uh, are way to generalize and provide a way to, um, that there's a, like, a lot of lack of specific experiences or um, you just, you just have to like, moderate the content that you see online and just take it with a grain of salt. But the lived experiences were really helpful for me because I was able to learn a lot about myself that I was in the process of unlearning and really trying to find answers for after my divorce. And um, being able to hear about autism in this way and ADHD and even the um, other like co-occurring and conditions such as like auditory processing, which is something I also experience. Um, it just made me feel so validated and it made me feel really seen and it made me feel like I wasn't broken. So when I went through that, like, this is going to make me emotional, but like when I went through the diagnosis process a couple of years ago, like I literally cried, like when I was meeting with my psychologist, um, who I think is on the call now. And we're going over my report and everything because it was such a validating experience. And for me, it's something I'm really passionate about, like sharing, because it's the reason why I use identity first language, because it is something that is a part of me. Like I can't change it. I can't make it go away. And the more that I can understand myself, the better I can support myself and have like share myself with others so that they know how to support me as well. And I think that this journey has been one of the most significant in my life. Um, and it's definitely something that like, I just find a lot of fulfillment in. 
um, in the advocate, advocation piece. And um, with what I do for work, I'm a learning experience designer. So I have the opportunity to use the creative parts of my brain and personality and my analytical problem solving parts of my brain and personality and like bring them together. And so um, I'm basically tasked with creating uh, learning experiences for adult learners and corporate environments. So that could be anything from compliance training or leadership development training or um, you know, implementing new programs and trying to figure out what the learning strategy looks like and how to roll it out and make sure that the content is meaningful. And I get the opportunity to really like ask all the questions that I want to ask so that I can understand what my learners need to know. And it feels really well suited for, for what I'm, you know, uh, what my strengths are. But on top of that, I'm also really involved in DEI in my, uh, company as well. So I'm a, co-chair for my women's group. And I really try to bring a lot of awareness into like neurodivergence and mental health and all these like invisible disabilities that people take for granted or think are just trendy and don't actually impact your day-to-day -day life. Like it impacts me like every single day. And it's hard when you have been trained and conditioned and taught how to portray yourself as something other than what you genuinely feel most of the time. And I, sometimes there's like a, a lot of, uh, I don't know, like dysmorphia there, but it's something that I'm trying to continuously learn about and be patient with myself and educate myself and learn the terminology and vocabulary so that I can share that with others. Um, and so I'm just really happy to have the opportunity to share my story and Hopefully, you know, my lived experiences would help somebody else who may be experiencing something similar. Virginia, thank you so much. And thank you for bringing up how important lived experiences are. And I should qualify that that study that was done on TikTok removed all videos that were self-advocates talking about their own experience. They did not include those in any of the analyses. So I just want to make that point because those are so important regardless of what the the diagnosis is. Um, so with that last, but certainly not least, Laura, um, tell us about your um, yourself. Sure. Um, thank you so much for the opportunity. And it's been wonderful, like hearing everyone's story. Um, I definitely see a lot of parallels there. Um, and I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Uh, I have quite a lengthy history um, that started in adolescence when it came to um, first getting psychiatric uh, services um, because I initially have a family history of bipolar disorder um, going back three generations. My grandma, um, who was institutionalized after having a psychotic break in the 1950s when she suffered a miscarriage and um, then I got the diagnosis next when I was in high school um, after suffering from severe depression and uh, suicide attempts and ended up in a psychiatric hospital. Um, and my mom also uh, started getting therapy um, and we all three of us saw the same psychiatrist when I was in high school. And what I initially thought for my mom was dysthymia, it turned out that it was actually a bipolar diagnosis as well. Um, but autism wasn't exactly on my radar because this was like the early aughts. And um, although I knew that my dad was very odd, um, that for whatever reason, um, he didn't really have any close friends. He preferred to do things alone. He would spend hours and hours in our basement working on model airplanes and watching either X-Files or Star Trek. Um, I didn't put two and two together until um, quite a few years later. Uh, so to go through the, uh, I guess, highlights. Um, despite suffering, I lost count of how many psychiatric hospitalizations throughout high school. I was able to graduate in 2004. Um, one of these hospitalizations included the uh, application deadline for school. So I ended up going to community college, which was actually the best thing that could happen for me. Um, so I excelled in community college. I earned my associates 
Um, and I also got to live at home, so I didn't have to deal with like the social demands of being at university. Um, and I was able to um, earn a very generous uh, scholarship to finish my four-year degree um, at pretty much any university I applied. Um, it was about 30,000 a year. So um, that was definitely something that uh, helped me get to where I am today. So I ended up going to Emory um, and I love the academics. Uh, like it was the most intellectually stimulating environment of my life. And I formed very close connections with some of my professors because I found that they were much easier to relate to. But um, when it came to the social sphere, I just, I, I didn't know what to do. Like it was something that I was wholly unprepared for just the um the expectations of like going out to clubs going out with friends like people who would try to befriend me like I would do okay at the beginning but I never really knew how to maintain those friendships and like most of the time like I would just sit passively listening and not really knowing how to contrib contribute to the conversation um and of course I didn't associate any of this with autism at that time um but I had um significant episodes of major depression coupled with suicidal ideation and attempts that um, led to my first two fall semesters. I had to take medical withdrawals. Um, and the fall 2007 ended with me undergoing a course of ECT. So it was following this that I took a semester off that spring. And it was at this time that I went back to see my um, psychiatrist that I saw throughout high school and he suggested you know, I think you might be on the autism spectrum and he recommended that I start going to the Emory Autism Center. So that's where my Emory, or that's where my autism journey began. And I met um, the person who has become my boyfriend for the past nearly 16 years. Um, and he was like the first close relationship I ever had and kind of really, you know, um, pulling me on my shell because it was okay for me to talk to him and not have to fear about you know, being judged or looked at funny if I misspoke or if I stuttered or any number of things that would um, be really hard for me to handle in social environments with people that I don't know that well. Um, so th the next couple of semesters went really well. And then um, at the end of summer 2009, when I was finishing up an internship, um, that was when my mom had her first attempt and she overdosed on lithium and she nearly died. Uh, so that kind of derailed everything. And um, I should have taken the following semester off. I didn't just because like it was, it was hard where I grew up. Like I, I do love my parents. It was very hard to live with them. Like we lived in, we were low or lower middle class. Um, we were not a family of means. And both my parents um, suffered with hoarding. So it wasn't a home environment that I wanted to be in. And also just having to witness the complications that my mom had after her attempt. Like it was too much for me to bear. So I tried to power through that semester, but I fell apart at the end of it. And I ended up um, making a very dangerous attempt on my own life, which necessitated um, disciplinary action because of the nature of the attempt. And uh, thankfully, um, part of my professors uh, sent a letter to the dean um, asking them to reconsider the decision and that allowed me a path to earning my degree, but I had to do it remotely. I could not be on campus at that time. So um, I was kind of treading water living back at home which was kind of the worst case scenario. So I spent most of those years depressed and not really making much progress on my degree. And then in January, 2014 um, was my mom's second attempt and um, she did die. Um, sorry. So uh, that was a really big turning point in my life. Um, and uh, I finally got to a point where I was able to make progress in my degree. 
And um, I was very fortunate to be able to move out of my parents' home um, in 2015 to where I am today. And um, I earned my degree in 2016. And then I started interning at Marcus, which quickly turned into a position in their um, behavior department. And then just working my way up to where my interest really was in research. And uh, that's where I'm at today. Sorry, I know that was a long story, but um, yeah, sorry. Laura, can I just commend you and all of the other panelists for your bravery and sharing your stories right now? I'm blown away because I know I wouldn't be able to sit here and tell that story. And I just, you are helping so many people. I am sure as hard as this is, it's resonating with so many people um, to realize that you're not alone. I know, because it's it's hard like hearing stories like Virginia's of, you know, growing up with an abusive family. Yeah. And like my parents weren't perfect, but um my mom out of everyone loved me more than anything. And uh yeah. it's one of those things where like when I was going through it, I didn't realize that when I was hurting myself, like because I hated myself, I I loathed myself. And um I didn't realize I was hurting her. <laughs> And, and just from a diagnostic perspective, for many of these women who got missed in early childhood, your histories, there it's, it's trauma, it's um, anxiety to depression and suicidality, multiple hospitalizations, where this underlying social vulnerability that never got detected is just still brewing. So all the treatments for all of these other conditions are failing. And that's when it comes to, uh, you know, whether the individual themselves finding neurodiverse, uh, you know, someone on TikTok or a clinician saying, maybe think about this when it resonates, what maybe autism is the underlying thing here that, you know, um, is getting missed. And so that's just such a telling story. Now, with that, we we have multiple questions that we wanted to ask our panelists, but there are so many questions and, dis and discussions going on online here, too, and we only have until 7 o'clock. Because you guys already answered the question about your journey, I do want to ask how autism has impacted your life. And um, if we can start maybe with Kayla, would you like to answer that question? Yeah, yeah. Um... Can I actually share my story too? Um, yes, of course. Sorry, just some questions. I thought that was, you know, um, second question. Um, so uh, uh, um, after I was diagnosed, well, okay, background. I was born in New York and I was, my mom and dad died, got divorced when I was three at the same around the same time I was diagnosed with PDD and I was put into ABA which I don't remember any of it but I do not recommend ABA I'm very against it for several reasons if there's one thing you could take away from me today just please don't put your kid in ABA um you know and you know there's a lot of inf you know there's a lot of information about why ABA is bad and um, I, I, I don't want to spend the whole time telling you all that, but just know, like, please don't go to ABA for your autistic child or anyone. But I was only in it for a short amount of time. I had a pretty good childhood until I was eight years old. And when I was eight, I was diagnosed with type one diabetes. And then the next month, um, my, uh, I moved to Florida and I started getting bullied in school until I got bullied until around like sophomore year of high school. Um, and, you know, um, I had to really, you know, I only knew in this whole entire time, I only knew one other autistic girl who was also the only autistic person I knew in general, you know, in school, this was like, you know, the 20, the 2000s, the early 2010s, that the early 2010s. So there wasn't really a lot of information about autism and especially autism in women back then. Um, and then I had to mask and uh, be invisible. You know, I was like, I had to pretend to be Pete someone. So uh, someone else so that other people would like me. And I feel like I felt like I had to be invisible. So I won't be bullied. It, um, 
got to the point where I had to be homebound and, um, and then, you know, I, this, I went, you know, and back when I was in Florida, I had a stepfather who ended up being abusive. Um, he groomed me. Um, and, uh, you know, he was an alcoholic and he we made out and, you know, and then I moved to Virginia and I still had trouble with bullies in school and, um, you know, and then, um, so, um, yeah, uh, and then I moved to Georgia about 2013 and then, uh, I had a traumatic time because my, um, around the, after my grandma died, um, I was, my stepfather, I mentioned, he, uh, sexually assaulted me and, um, trigger warning for sexual assault. Um, sorry. Um, but I thought that's important to share because I can't be the only one. I can't be the only autistic woman who has dealt with sexual assault. And matter of fact, I'm not. And there's a lot of autistic women who have gone through that. But there's no really, you know, preventative measures taken place or like, there's not, like the thing is that it's been 11 years, I'm still struggling with it. And it's like, terrible, you know? And it's like, why can't there be something about autism and trauma, you know? There's not a lot of research about that. So yeah, I was sexually assaulted and the, he's not in my life anymore, thank God. But um, that was really hard. Um, and then I graduated, I went to a different school and um, I went to, they took me, they couldn't take me anymore. So I went to a GNET school. I had a lot of meltdowns in my senior year of high school because I was sexually assaulted when I was 16. And um, I had, you know, my senior year of high school and um, I was just having a lot of meltdowns and they basically gave up on me. And they gave me, put me into a GNET school, which I didn't know was a GNET. I didn't know what GNETs was at the time, but like basically GNETs is like a, it's really insulting, you know? Um, it's like a school for like disabled people and like lower income people. Well, I don't know if it's lower income, but definitely for disabled people. And they just treat them like, ugh. so anyway, um, yeah. And um, so, um, I did eventually graduate. Um, I had, by that point I had OCD and PT, now it's complex PTSD. Um, I didn't really get much support after high school and I was pressured to go to college, even though I didn't want to. Um, I ended up trying it for a semester and then I dropped out. Um, that was, that was rough. So, and then, you know, I've also had my mental health struggles. Um, even as recently as this year, like I attempted like trigger warning for suicidality, but I was, I've been suicidal on and off since I was 11 years old. And the earlier this year I, I attempted and I went to a hot, you know, I went to, I've been to a few hospitals like Laura and earlier this year I attempted, you know, suicide trigger warning, sorry. And I went to the hospital again. Um, hospitals are not a great, the best place for autistic people. Um, but I, I know there's no other option. Like, you know, you have to keep someone safe, but it could get better for accommodating autistic people and people with this, disabled people in these settings, you know, because, men, you know, pe disabled people can be mentally ill too, you know. So, but, um, yeah, so after I tried college, I found um, the Atlanta, what was then the Atlanta Division of the Autistic self Advocacy Network, or ASAN, when I went to their Disability Day of Mo Morning they were hosting. Sorry. I joined that group, and then I learned about autism advocacy for the first time. I, I joined, I then did three advocacy training programs, including LEND. During that time, I co-created the Autistic Women's Group with Susan, so autistic women wouldn't feel alone like I did. The group was originally in person, but now been held on Zoom since the pandemic began. 
And I was invited to join the Autistic Women and Non-Binary Network in 2020. And I, of course, joined. And I've been doing advocacy work since then. And I'm currently unemployed. I had I had I had an internship and I had a, a part-time job, but I got laid off again because, you know, um the work organization I was working with working with, they I think they, they didn't have a lot of money. So um that's my story as of right now. Um I'm 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 doing some, you know, I'm gonna I started a new mental health treatment. I'm gonna start another one soon. So hopefully I'll move on from my trauma. Um, you know, um, so yeah. And then how odds is, what was the, the question? Um, autism impacted my life or something. Uh-huh. Well, autism has impacted my life in many ways, number of ways and mostly good. I wouldn't be me without autism and I wouldn't be an advocate and know all the amazing people I do now if I wasn't autistic. For that reason alone, I'm grateful to be autistic, even though it does come with its challenges. Like, okay, I have, I, I have ARFRID, well, self-diagnosed ARFRID, which is avoidant restrictive to intake disorder. And that's a common co-diagnosis with autism. And that, I don't like that I have that. And, you know, the fact that I have meltdowns, not every autistic person has tons of meltdowns, but, you know, in my case, I get to have meltdowns when I'm stressed. And, but I feel like a lot of the problems autistic people have aren't really because of our autism, but it's really because of the ableist society we live in, a society that doesn't accommodate and accept us. And yeah, I, I you know, like, Maybe I would have less meltdowns if things were more accommodating or not overwhelming, you know? And, you know, I think with autism, it's not a superpower. I don't believe it's a superpower, nor is it bad. It's just a different way of being human. Autism is imperfect, but neither is anyone else. And I just, I'm just tired of living in a world where I'm not accepted we're not accepted and we're not accommodated for it. And I hope I'm part of the change and I hope that does change in the future. So, um, yeah, sorry that that was long. Um, No, Kayla, you're making really good points and your advocacy is so important. And the fact that you started this group with with Susan, I should let everyone know that Dr. Susan Brasher is feeling under the weather, um, but she does phenomenal research on uh, in this area and has run with Kayla a woman's group for what five five years. It's been yeah, it's years. been I think and it's been past, yeah, but um, six years actually. Um, it'll be six years. I haven't been in the groups that often because you know I've had a hard year. But, um, I, you know, I get busy. So it's mainly Susan who holds the fort. So I thank you, Susan, for that. Um, but yeah, I, we co-create, I did, I can say that I did create it with her. And, you know, hopefully I'm helping the people, the girls, the autistic women in it. You absolutely are. And so along the lines of um, describing how autism has impacted your life, Dylan, would you like to go next? Yes, please. Um, so uh, I just wanted to say that, um, I actually, um, got my GED in, uh, 2009. It was, uh, that long ago. So I just wanted to clear that up. But anyway, I'm going to combine those two questions of how, um, my journey started, uh, with a woman on the spectrum and describing how it impacted my life, if that's okay. Um, so growing up as a neurodivergent, um, I obviously learned over time that I was different and I had to learn that my brain was wired um, a little differently because I had various ways of uh, talking, expressing, and or understanding. Um, and I've had a lot of um, challenges in my adolescence, which started from when I was learning um, to talk. And communication, like even even like from then to now, like it proved to me um, difficult for me because when I was like 
when I started to talk, I could barely like um, talk at all or make direct eye contact with people, let alone be near or physically close to them. Because even to this day, I often find um, social interaction stressful. And another reason why I find it stressful is because I don't always um, say precisely what I intend to say. And I sometimes like struggle to find the right words during social um, interaction. And sometimes it makes me um, feel kind of like uh, misunderstood and withdrawn. Um, also like um, I have some idiosyncratic behaviors uh, like, for example, I can be like uh, a little fidgety and I can't really, um, I, it's hard for me to like sit still. So, you know, please excuse me if I was like uh, moving around a little bit uh, during this. And I also like tend to play like with inanimate objects. Like, for example, I would often like twist a hanger, uh, those little hooks off hangers or like pull threads out of my clothes. And I would like pace a lot whenever I was alone. Um, and with social, uh, interactions, like going back to, uh, um, having trouble, uh, expressing An example would be, um, if I want food or if I did or didn't want to hang out with, uh, somebody, or I couldn't really, um, express what was, um, bothering me. And another one of, uh, challenges that I have in particular is flashbacks of um, past events that I kind of like wish didn't happen. Like if something like um, sort of unsettling happened or um, if I was in like a fight or uh, whatever or was um, being yelled at, um, I can instantly like remember that due to my photographic memory. And I can even remember like the simplest things, like if what I was doing before my fifth birthday or something like that. And uh, when I was in my 20s, I started to uh, develop a really high anticipatory anxiety. And unfortunately, years later, I still have um, anticipatory anxiety. And all of these um, challenges that I've had have triggered a lot of um, frustrations and agitations and uh, being overwhelmed, shutdowns, and even meltdowns. And I've been known to have a couple of anxiety attacks every now and then. And I'm also known to have um, OCD and misophonia or sensitivity to sounds like if a car alarm was incessantly uh, going off or really loud noises. And also I have a really repetitive uh, speech and or perseveration. But when I got older, I've um, developed a lot of uh, methods that would help me um, cope with being on the spectrum. For example, um, therapy helped and you know, Celine um, is a really good friend of my mom, and I've, again, known her for a really long time, and she's somebody who I definitely have looked up to. And I also took medications for um, anxiety, OCD, and also depression. I was able to um, overcome or try to overcome my misophonia by thinking about or listening like to music if I was in a crowded area or I was trying to fight against other noises. So basically, I was kind of fine fighting sound with sound in, uh, if you will. And I, another, um, what? There has been a hobby that I have um, really grown to love over the years, and that was taking self-defense classes. And that not only helped me overcome my discomfort of being touched, but it also like um, helped me to unwind. And also, when I was um, a child, I used to volunteer in um, colleges and universities, such as Boston University and Yale, um, with studies in autism. 
And a group of researchers have evaluated me and that helped them to upgrade their research in autism and other um, developmental disorders. For example, they would have me um, read this book, which I remember was about like a swarm of frogs that would like literally go flying uh, throughout the night. But there weren't any words herds in that book. So I basically had to uh, narrate the book uh, based on what I found in uh, the illustrations. Um, and there is also like been this uh, kind of stereotype with uh, women or girls in in general. Um, there's like a misconception that we're like um, a lot more sensitive like than men or boys, like especially like there's a misconception that we're especially more sensitive if we're um, on the spectrum uh, or whatever. But honestly, like that's, I think that uh, everyone has um, some amount of sensitivity in them. And some people like um, are entitled to wear their heart on their, their uh, feelings are on their sleeves or they're really like in touch with how they feel and how others feel. And something like that or any like other vulnerabilities we, we have, like it should um, never be used who's against us. And what I particularly feel um, about all of this is that um, currently women and girls are getting a lot more recognition of being on the uh, spectrum. And we're now like um, speaking out and we're advocating um, for ourselves as neurodivergent because they um, obviously like um, have just as much um, of a say in things and like are just as capable as um, boys or men. And um, for me, even though like sometimes like talking about my um, autism uh, can be um, a little uh, touchy for me because I don't like to um, feel judged or about it or to feel like um, misunderstood um, for it. I feel like that I do have like um, a responsibility to share my life stories and to advocate because I um, would uh, want to bring um, more awareness and also um, to help like other women or girls who have gone through like similar experiences that I have. And hopefully like uh, what I say, like, uh, sharing my stories and my coping methods um, could help them in, in a way because at the end of the day, like um, just as much as men and boys do, women deserve to like have as much um, treatment and research um, and attention. And that's why um, I think this um, discussion like um, is so pivotal because I feel like it's a stepping stone for that. And it, it's so important. I love how you shared how you participated in research because we wouldn't be anywhere in this field without the individuals and the families participating in research. That's how we know what we know. Um, so it's just a testament to you and everyone who, who gives their time and effort there. And so Virginia, how about you? How has autism impacted your life? Yeah, I think, um, I mean, obviously there's positives and negatives, um, just like anything else, there's the duality there. Um, it's been really difficult to try to find systems and routines that work for me, um, especially being an ADHD girly of having autism and ADHD and trying to like figure out, okay, what does my brain need today? Dopamine? Great. Routine? Great. Nothing? Okay. Well, today's a crapshoot. Um, so it is really like, I have to be very patient with myself and give myself a lot of grace, even though I am operating in an ableist society and trying to produce, uh, to the, um, the quality and the quota that is expected of me. And so that part can be really, really hard. And, I've experienced burnout so many times and 
trying to recover from burnout is the worst. And I'm really trying to be mindful about my capacity limitations. Um, it's been hard. I have a lot of money issues because budgeting and finance are things that I just can't seem to find a non-neurotypical approach to um, that works for me. And so that is something that I'm continuously working through, but has always and probably will always be a bit of a struggle. Um, I am a creative, so as my job and also just for hobbies, I, I paint, I write, I do photography, I sing, I do a little bit of everything. And I think that my autism and my neurodivergence has allowed me, this is actually probably more of my ADHD than anything, like getting excited about a new hobby and picking it up and investing so much money and time into it. And then being like, okay, what's the next thing? But like, I don't, I'm not afraid of failing. I'm not afraid of trying something and not being good at it. It's just the act of exploration and curiousness. And I think for me, my autism, and I put this in a comment in the chat, has like really allowed me to see things differently than what I'm learning and recognizing a lot of people see when they walk through the world. Um, I think it's made me more creative and like kinder and more inclusive human. I have a very strong sense of social justice and was always getting in trouble growing up because if something was wrong, it was wrong. And there is, I have been able to adjust my black and white thinking and allow myself a little bit more of that curiousness to kind of drive that conversation or to approach different perspectives or people with a little bit more curiosity. Um, I'm also really interested in psychology. So like, that's another rabbit hole hyper fixation that's kind of helped um, kind of shape my outlook on a lot of things. Um, it's also helped me with myself a lot too. Um, I don't know. I think it's just like anything, right? It's like, there's, especially like when since we're all here and we're, you know, women or, you know, non-binary or whatever we are um, uh, identifying as in that term, it, it feels like there is just so much intersectionality with everything. And especially with neurodivergence or the invisible disabilities, like it's already difficult walking in the world in one capacity. And then when you have all these other layers and other filters and other like dials that have been turned to where it kind of customizes the experience a little bit more, it's harder to navigate because there's more trial and error involved. And we don't have a lot of grace for trying new things. Like they're kind of, you have this period where you're kind of encouraged to do that in college, but if you didn't go to college traditionally, you didn't have that opportunity. And if you weren't, I don't know, like sometimes like that's also difficult too. Like somebody mentioned like the social aspects. I think it was Laura, like navigating campus life. I was so excited to go to school after being homeschooled and gotten, get, gotten my GED that like, I felt like it was strong main character energy. I'm just like walking around with my books in my arms and there's like leaves falling down. I'm like, I'm a college student, but I didn't know where to eat lunch. And so I ate in my car and I couldn't make friends because I didn't know how to talk to them. And the one time I tried to make friends, they were doing a blood drive and I can't give blood because I pass out. But I was like, no, I'm going to give blood because I'm going to be a good human. And then I couldn't give blood because I passed out and that friendship didn't really go anywhere. But there's all these like different little weird nuances like I don't do well with nuances I do well with really like straightforward like directive communication like tell me what you want from me like what is the expectation here don't use jargon don't use like flowery sayings just like tell me what you want from me because I'm going to spend hours trying to decipher things and then come up with a direction that I'm supposed to be moving in only to find out that it's wrong or for me to come back and be like, okay, well, I need more clarification. I mean, I've been labeled argumentative and combative in the workforce because I just have more questions or I don't understand, or this doesn't seem like the right approach. And 
it's not always up to me to make that decision or decide where we're going or why we're going this way. We just have to go that way. And that's something I have to like really work on because um, I like simultaneously need to understand the whole thing, like all the pieces involved, but you don't always have that luxury. So long, I mean, long story short, it's, it's affected me in so many different ways. Um, and it's just a constant learning process. I, in Virginia, I would just love to say that you're saying, well, I don't know how to, you know, to change myself to address those needs in the workplace. For example, how can the workplace change to accommodate neurodiversity, you know, and, and that's one of the questions. They like, can how start, can be... just to respond real quick, they can start yeah. by educating themselves and not putting the responsibility yeah. on the people with disabilities to justify their needs. That's something that they can start doing. Awesome. That's all I'll say about that. We need, we could have a whole discussion just on that. Mm -hmm. And Susan, we probably should thinking, cause we only have five minutes left. I can't believe how fast this went by. Um, but I want to, I know we had so many other questions that we wanted to address, but um, if I can jump just so we have some variety in the, in the questions, Chloe, what would you like the audience to know about women on the spectrum? Okay, I'm also gonna kill two birds with one stone here, yeah. which is an idiom, meaning I'm gonna do two things at once because someone had mentioned in the chat, it was either the chat or the Q&A, and it's an anonymous attendee, but um, they were talking about, um, let me try to find it. Uh, what are the success stories of women who had autism caught early? And I wanna talk about um, like, Nobody, like Kayla had mentioned, I'm going to echo this, but nobody's perfect. And with women on the spectrum, you know, and with anybody on the spectrum, really, but just because, you know, they don't do, and this is something I've had to learn because I felt like, in my opinion, my dad never, like, he always had this, like, you need to do it this way. You need to do it that way. You need to get a job. You need to do this. You need to do that. And he, I kind of felt like he wanted me to act typical per se and because of the denial, but just because I don't do the typical things doesn't mean my life is perfect. So one person's definition of success could be, you know, wouldn't be the same for somebody else. So like Laura's definition was she went off to college and she now works for the Marcus Autism Center um, and helping others that are just like her. And my definition of success wasn't going to college, but I found my tribe and my special interest happens to be like spina bifida and stuff like, cause that's a long story, but I, really got into it and I met my tribe there and that's how I became an advocate and that's how I became invested in all these different panels and like advocating on Congress for Till on the Hill and that's my success story and my success story does not involve an, a degree but that doesn't make it any more different and no one's success story should be also be judged as to whether they were diagnosed early on or later on in life. Cause I thought I was diagnosed early on in life, but my, I live a per, I live to me a perfect life and the life that I have always wanted to live um, ever since my dad passed away. But I feel like, again, that shouldn't be, you know, Success stories are different. Um, and I'm thinking, and this person can correct me if I'm wrong and call out my bluff, but I'm assuming that it's a parent and they want a little bit of hope. Like they got the doom and gloom saying, your child's going to be a vegetable. Your child may never speak. Your child's nonverbal. But that doesn't mean that their life can't be perfect for them. And parents, I feel like, and I'm sorry if I'm derailing off the tracks here, but I feel like parents 
they're given that doom and gloom and it's like a gut punch to the stomach or like a soccer ball's just been thrown at your head and then you know you fall down and you wake up and you feel like you're in some sort of like nightmare or whatever and it doesn't have to be a nightmare you're individual even though life may be different it doesn't make it any less perfect and your success stories like your individual success stories or my success story is going to be different because autism is a spectrum and and just that kind of stuff so i'd like to know like people to know in conclusion that autism you know not everyone on there it's a spectrum so success is measured differently but autistic individuals also mask like women and masking is like what uh celine talked about earlier where we hide our autistic traits to become to fit into society and i remember um basically you know, I would mimic what I saw on TV and Lord knows I got in trouble for it because some of that stuff was inappropriate. Thanks a lot, autism. But anyway, that was sarcasm for anyone that doesn't pick up on that. Um, and then, you know, basically um, just stuff like that, you know, because we camouflage, I feel like that's kind of overlooked in the assessments and stuff. and. Also, there weren't a lot of, there were autistic females back then. It's just like that block game that you played when you were a baby where they had all the different shapes. It was trying to like fit a, fitting a square shape into a triangle because, um, you know, basically, because like for me, I got diagnosed with PDD-NOS, whereas my brother, ben, and I had to get diagnosed again to become autistic because I was borderline, whereas my brother, Ben, he only had to get uh, diagnosed once and then he ended up being autistic. So it may take a couple of tries for women to get diagnosed. And then, and I also understand the financial burden that can it can put on people, especially when health insurance doesn't cover it. And I would like them to know that self-diagnosis is completely valid um, but just be sure not to use TikTok as your only like source and seek out actually autistic advocates, seek out like autistic organizations like the Atlanta Autism Consortium probably has like a bunch of stuff on there. Um, you know, I want to share out about my autism diagnosis eventually, but we are capable. We, our life may not be perfect to what your standards may have been like oh you know my baby's going to be captain of the soccer team you know she's going to do ballet be captain of the debate team it probably won't be that and that's completely okay you know someone's path doesn't define their worth anyways i think i'm rambling on i'll stop oh that was fantastic i love your your passion and it's coming through and everyone in the chat does too and you have so many great things to say all of you do we're over time um but laura didn't have a second chance to to answer a question i just want to throw it out to you laura any last last words to everyone oh um Honestly, I'm kind of during the headlights at the moment. I was just writing back uh, for Tyler's question to oh, okay. reach out to you directly. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, well, yeah, I, I, I second the people here. Sorry, I was listening and also writing in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, but, answering yeah. the questions is just as important because there are so many people here asking. And Dylan, you had one more thing to say. Uh, one thing that like I want to kind of say like it's similar to like uh, the men and girl uh, ratio of the diagnosis of autism. Um, I'm someone like who has either been the only girl or own, or one of uh, two or three girls who has either been in my classes or uh, the various jobs that um, I've worked. And it's been hard to like uh, hold my own, like uh, it's been like outnumbered uh, by men. And, you know, with this uh, ratio that was um, previously um, higher, it's like I said that like um, with women having the chance to um, advocate 
I think like even doing the hardest thing, like um, sharing your um, life life stories or what you've been through um, can be um, like an, an incredible thing because like the more awareness that you can uh, bring, um, the easier that uh, it might be um, to be as equal um, to um, the diagnosis uh, to men and boys. So if you have a, sh a story that you want to tell and you feel like you want to share it, then share it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I actually, oh, sorry. And I actually thought um, of what to say um, that an autistic life is very much worth living. Um, I didn't think so when I first got the diagnosis, but it was a very long journey to get to where I am today. And I thank God that I'm here. I thank God that I'm who I am. And being an autistic woman is part of who I am. It doesn't necessarily define me as all of me, but it's a very important part of me. And I would not be myself without it. So for that, I'm thankful. That's awesome. And and just knowing that every individual has strengths. And I think when we're talking about conditions, disorders, what disabilities, whatever you want to call it, that people focus on that being a negative. These are symptoms, so they're negative and looking at weaknesses and they're not. So many of these characteristics are unbelievable strengths and you are all showing them tonight. And I'm just so grateful for all of you being here. I just have one one, one thing. Well, four quick things. The, um, please don't do ABA, number one. Please don't support Autism Speaks and all right, all right, Kayla. organizations that support, you know, like want to cure and, you know, uh, prevent and treat autism. Um, try to diagnose autistic people of all genders. And the last thing I'll say is, please accept us and listen to us and, you know, please listen in, in, to autistic people and accept and accommodate autistic people. If you do that, our lives will be so much better. Not that they're terrible to begin with, but it would be so much better. So yeah, that's all I want to say. Thank you, Kayla. And Susan, yeah, I want to give you an opportunity to speak and close out. Are you, did she? No. Did we? Yes. I'm still here. Thank you everyone for joining our call tonight. I see Chloe or Smitty has a, a hand up and we can answer that in the chat as we close out. But from the Atlanta Autism Consortium, we wanted to thank all of our panelists and all the attendees and all the, the thought that you put into the responses that you all had tonight and the responses that were given to you as well. We will definitely keep the conversation going. We will post this on our YouTube channel and hope to have a part two or a second panel to offer more opportunities for people to share their experiences.